Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, depending where you are joining us from. This is the opening session of the fourth Asia Finance Forum, Reinventing Finance for Sustainability and Inclusion. My name is Joost Wagner, and I have the pleasure and honor to guide you through the next three days. And this is the first time we are conducting the Asia Finance Forum in an online format. So one of the benefits conducting virtual events is, of course, that many people can join us from all over the world. So we have prepared a small poll for you to show us where are you joining us from. So I will show the results later, but please take a moment and indicate which region is your region where you're joining us from or where you belong to. So we have many choices, West Asia, Central Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, East Asia, then we have Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific, Europe, North America, or South and Central America. So please indicate briefly where you are joining us from or where you're located, and we will show the results after the welcome remarks. But now let's set the scene for a short, with a short three-minute video we have prepared for you. So may I request to play the short film our colleagues have prepared on the Asia Finance World. The world is rapidly changing due to climate change. It continues to get hotter and more polluted. It disrupts the ecosystem services that can severely affect livelihoods, food security, and health, with a potential to create or exacerbate fragility and conflict. Addressing the climate change impacts require a wide range of solutions and interventions, which means massive capital is needed to reduce pressures on ecosystems and communities. But investors are facing numerous financing gaps in Asia and the Pacific. The Asian Development Bank aims to bring policymakers, academia, and experts from financial institutions in the fourth Asia Finance Forum to discuss the latest innovations and trends in financing sustainable infrastructure for driving transition to net zero and supporting financial inclusion. Solutions on the innovative use of green, blue, and climate financing instruments and business models can drive investments towards a net zero economy. Discussions on the piloting and regulatory approval of climate and carbon bonds, as well as building capacity among financial institutions, regulators, and prospective users of innovative financial instruments can reduce risks and vulnerabilities of climate change. Green inclusive finance can aid low-income households, micro, small and medium enterprises, small farmers and women become resilient to adapt to emerging climate change impacts. New peer-to-peer -peer trading platforms can allow rural residents to access solar power. Poor households with access to microloans can build better and more secure affordable housing. With these goals, the role of governments and multilateral development banks in supporting sustainable, climate-resilient infrastructure development is key to raise awareness on climate change and fast-forward the green recovery of the economy. And as Asia rebuilds its economies, the delegates are laying a path towards sustainable and inclusive finance that can help create a greener and brighter future for all. Thank you very much. This sets the scenes, I think, very well for the welcome remarks and the official opening of the fourth Asia Finance Forum. And I have the pleasure to hand over to the Managing Director General of the Asian Development Bank. He is also currently the officer in charge as a Vice President for Knowledge Management and Sustainable Development. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Wu Chong Om, who will deliver the welcome remarks on behalf of the Asian Development Bank. Wu Chong, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much. Jules, you can hear me okay? Just give me a thumbs up. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor to be giving this welcome remarks at the fourth Asia Finance Forum. This year's theme is on reinventing finance for sustainability and inclusion. We have an impressive turnout of policymakers, regulators, supervisors, central bankers, investors, financial institutions, fintech companies, and academia from all around the world to join this event. We are in 2022, about halfway through. And as we start to see the pandemic in our rear view mirror, hopefully, we have to take a concrete steps to build back better for the future, which include quantum leaping the region's climate actions. Clearly, sustainable finance is an urgently needed agenda, which will help us overcome many risks posed by climate change. This forum can help us innovate strategies and financing solutions to convert this looming threat into an opportunity to integrate climate risks and costs into decision-making. Asia and the Pacific produces half of global greenhouse gas emissions and is home to the largest emitters. And sea surface temperatures and ocean warming in and around Asia are increasing more than the, more than the global average, risking more frequent and severe climate-related disasters. At the same time, climate change directly threatens the responsibility of financial sector policymakers for ensuring financial stability and safeguarding people's savings. Therefore, policymakers are crucial for encouraging systemic change for improving the commercial viability, deploying de-risking measures, and unlocking private capital to decarbonize the economy. In addition to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, climate actions will need to include reducing stranded assets, enhancing resilience, and boosting economic returns. Nonetheless, a lack of disclosure of the climate risks and underdeveloped regulatory frameworks stand in the way. More attention is needed on how prudential regulator, regulations can encourage financial decisions that are climate compatible. Clarity in fiduciary duties and capital, solvency and liquidity requirements can certainly lower regulatory barriers. They can also boost incentives for financial sector players to integrate climate considerations into their investment and loan decisions. In all of this, central banks, regulators, and the financial industry need to work together to strengthen and harmonize regulation data, disclosures, and taxonomies. In doing so, these financial market stakeholders can better manage climate-related financial risks, as well as increase overall transparency and avoid greenwashing. Unfortunately, efforts at climate financing fall far short of what is needed today. This is partly because financial actors have not fully understood or internalized the physical climate and long-term tr transition risks. This risks market failures in climate finance. Markets and private sector must help mobilize the and, and efficiently allocate resources and put a price on climate risks. This shortcoming also in underscores the important role for development institutions to provide and catalyze needed financing through strong partnership with those actors as well. The Asian Development Bank, as the premier climate bank for the Asian the Pacific region, is proud to lead the fight against climate change. Through this forum, we hope to mobilize stronger support from the Asian the Pacific region's banks and financial institutions, capital markets, and the insur insurance industry. Yes. On how ADB is boosting its role in the. Um, so we had some technical difficulties for a moment, so we continue immediately. So, Mr. Wu Chong, please. So, where did I? Where did you lose me? <laughs> so maybe you can start again. Um, the role of the ADB. Um, yeah, okay. Just proud to lead the fight. All right, so I'll go. Yeah, sorry about the technical difficulty. So, so the Asian Development Bank, as the premier climate bank for the Asian Pacific region, is proud to lead the fight against climate change. 
Through this forum, we hope to mobilize stronger support from the Asia and the Pacific region's banks and financial institutions, capital markets, and the insurance industry. By investing in an economy based on low carbon technology and resource efficiency, we can boost job creation, productivity, and people's welfare in our region. Now let me expand a bit more on how ADB is boosting its role in the fight against climate change through the financial sector. First, we and the other multilateral development banks are aligning operations with the Paris Agreement, which we are finalizing the methodology to ensure our financing promotes low carbon and climate resilience. Second, our policy advice is helping members strengthen the wider enabling environment. We are addressing potential financial stability risks through regulatory reforms, longer term capacity development of financial institutions, and raising climate change awareness. Third, we are identifying new business opportunities on the transaction side and supporting climate resilient infrastructure development to reduce risks and vulnerabilities to climate change. Innovative initiatives, including crowding in institutional investors who can pilot a new range of blended finance instruments as well. Some of the new lending facilities for concessional funding significantly lower the borrowing cost and support financial stability, sustainability, and drive financial inclusion. In addition, more proven financial instruments are being developed, such as first loss tranches, credit guarantees, and capitalizing the blue carbon credit generated by projects. Fourth, we are highlighting new areas such as the blue finance. Even though financial markets are fully embracing the green agenda, they remain behind the curve on the blue finance. So last year, ADB issued its first blue bond, advancing its ambitious plan to build sustainable blue economies and use the financial markets to scale up ocean solutions. Fifth, we are encouraging new technologies and digitalization. These could efficiently address new climate change obstacles and truly advance climate resilience and ensure equitable access to finance. Innovative examples of ADB support for its members include weather index insurance, which will help small farmers insure against unpredictable rainfall and get the, and get the needed payout in a timely manner, and access to micro, micro loans to help poor households build better and more secure housing. But let me close my remarks by thanking everyone, everyone once again for participating in this important forum. We're hoping the forum can help integrate the principles of sustainable development and social and economic inclusion into financial decision making. And frank exchange of ideas at this forum will certainly help prioritize our collective and immediate midterm priorities for the Asian and the Pacific region. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, much to the Managing Director General, Mr. Wu Chong Om of the Asian Development Bank for your opening remarks. I'm sure everybody appreciates um, what you said about the frank exchange of ideas to help us prioritizing collective immediate and medium term priorities for Asia and the Pacific. And we probably join you all in hoping that this forum can help to integrate the principles of sustainable development and social and economic inclusion into financial decision making. Also very interesting to hear about ADB's um, boosting its role in the fight against climate change. Thank you so much, sir. And I move on. And as you remember, if you have joined on time, we conducted a short survey to get a rough idea where people are joining us from. So let's have a brief look at the results. So, and as you can see, of course, no surprise, there is um, Asia is very prominent, especially Southeast Asia. Um, it looks like I must say that uh, the time is not very convenient for people from the United States and South America, but maybe they, have, they will join us a little bit later because it's in the middle of the night. So, but we have quite some people getting up early from Europe. So thank you very much for joining. And now um, I would like to move on and let's hear a little bit more about the motivation and the objectives of the ADB to host its fourth Asia Finance Forum. And this will be done by the Chief of Finance Sector Group at the Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department of the ADB, Mr. Junkyu Lee. 
Mr. Lee is also a former G20 finance advisor and brings tremendous experience on financial development policy to the table. So we are very happy to hear your thoughts. Over to you, Mr. Lee. Thank you, Joost. And do you hear me well? Excellent. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Hello, everyone, and I think we are all excited to be here for this uh, Fourth Asia Finance Forum. Our theme this year, uh, Reinventing Finance for Sustainability and Inclusion. Everyone here understands that climate change is a major threat and challenge. And as carbon emission scenarios unfold, it is clear that they will significantly affect economies and financial sectors in Asia and the Pacific. Yet climate change is also an opportunity for the financial sector to help mobilize the massive funds and provide catalytic capital and develop risk mitigation instruments necessary for transitioning to a net zero economy. And the sector can help economies and financial institutions adapt and mitigate the effects. So we are here today to share international financial sector experience to understand how we can achieve our goals. And we will learn how finance can help developing countries boost climate resilience at the same time that we secure sustainable and equitable economic growth. And we will review the vital support and governments and multilateral development banks can provide as governments aim for sustainable climate resilient infrastructure and to crowd in the financial fi private sector funds essential to those efforts. Institutional investors and capital markets and regulators, after all, are crucial in enabling the innovation that can overcome the challenges we face. And presentations today will look at the innovative use of green, blue, and climate financing instruments and business models that can drive investment towards net zero emissions and enable deployment at scale. In this area, it is important that we establish a sustainable finance framework and uh, capacitate financial institutions to design, pilot, and scale up new blue and green financial instruments and incorporate climate proofing and climate resilience measures. And we will discuss how regulatory and policy approaches can support financial inclusion. And our participants, we also present exciting new developments in sustainable finance and innovations, driving financial inclusion and including for small enterprises. And we will hear about agricultural finance and affordable housing. We will also look at closely at the interconnected relationship between finance, affordable and clean energy and gender equality and clean water and sanitation, good health and quality education. I look forward to your active participation as we all learn from each other during the last three days. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jung Kyu. And you all heard it, a lot of interesting sessions coming up. We have two major sessions today and another two on Tuesday and another two on Wednesday, including one more keynote speech on Tuesday. But you will also hear more from Mr. Jung Kyu Lee tomorrow morning at the beginning of day two. So um, I wanted to remind everybody, we have a hashtag for you, Asia Finance Forum 2022. So if you want to share your thoughts on social media, please do so. We definitely would like to hear your comments and thoughts on Twitter, LinkedIn, or whatever platform you use. But now it's the time for our first keynote of day one. We are very happy that Mark Carney, the UN Special Envoy on Climate Action and Finance has accepted to deliver our first keynote of the fourth Asia Finance Forum. There is a lot to say about Mr. Carney and he's definitely no stranger to many of you. Mr. Carney also served as a UK Prime Minister Johnson's finance advisor for COP26. He's also a former governor of the Bank of England, a former governor of the Bank of Canada, and he also had held many international assignments, such as the Financial Stability Board from 2011 to 2018. But I wanted especially to highlight that Mr. Carney co-chairs the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, G Funds, together with Mike Bloomberg. So G Funds is a global coalition of leading financial institutions committed to accelerating the decarbonization of the economy. And G Funds has recently announced that 
its formation of its Asia Pacific network. So I think we will hear about that more in the speech of Mr. Kane, and I'm sure that we all want to contribute to this new GFUNDS APAC network. So Mr. Kane, we are looking forward to your keynote. Over to you. Good morning. I'd like to thank the Asian Development Bank and the Government of Indonesia for convening this event and extend my deepest appreciation to all the colleagues and partners that are gathered here today for your timeless and essential climate leadership. Um, we're gathering at a critical juncture for climate. Uh, we're meeting halfway uh, between the COP26 in Glasgow and COP27 in Egypt. Um, and we're already a quarter of a way through what must be the decade of delivery for the net zero transition. So in other words, the stakes couldn't be higher, particularly in the Asia Pacific region, where climate change poses profound set of risks to our economies, to businesses, livelihoods, and threatens in some cases to undo decades of gains in development and human welfare. To address climate change, the world needs a sustainable revolution at the scale of the industrial revolution and at the pace of the digital transformation. So it's no small task. Uh, but to this end, finally, 140 countries comprising over 90% of global emissions have committed to net zero. That's one of the triumphs of the last few years is those commitments. And these commitments are now cascading down to thousands of the world's leading companies and the best in the financial industry that serve them. Now, as in so many things, the Asian Pacific region will determine whether or not the world succeeds in this quest. Asia is responsible for more than 50% of the world's emissions and that share will only rise in the near term. Asia is home to billions of people that will be most exposed to the impacts of unmitigated climate change. And crucially, Asia is home to many of the solutions a leader in green technologies, a store of enormous nature-based solutions, a host of innovative financial markets, and most fundamentally, possessing the entrepreneurial spirit and the financial resources that are needed to drive change. And of course, money is no good if it's sitting in a bank. It needs to be put to work. And that's why the world's leading financial institutions have banded together in the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. We're now number over 500 of the world's largest insurers, banks, asset owners, and asset managers from 45 countries controlling balance sheets of over $130 trillion. That's 40% of the world's private financial assets. And those assets are committed to be managed and specifically to manage the finance emissions. So in other words, emissions of portfolio companies uh, on a pathway to net zero consistent with limiting global warming to one and a half degrees. GFAN's members have committed to use science-based guidelines across all emission scopes and to set interim targets that represent a fair share of the 50% decarbonization required by 2030. And they're developing net zero transition strategies with a commitment to report on their progress annually. GFAN's is ha harnessing the power of finance to address climate change, but to succeed, it needs even greater participation, greater guidance and leadership from Asia. Let me signal out two critical areas. First, the world needs a common architecture for the net zero transition. And that's why on June 15th, GFANS released for public consultation, the main components of that framework, namely first recommendations and guidance on financial institution net zero transition plans. And this uh, element of the consultation is open until uh, the 27th of July. Secondly, we need guidance on sectoral pathways for financial institutions. So in other words, what is the pace at which uh, emissions are reduced in the steel sector, in the maritime sector, in technology areas? Thirdly, uh, what do we expect from companies? In other words, guidance for so-called real economy transition plans. We should have a similar ask from across the financial uh, from across financial institutions uh, to companies that we serve. Fourth, uh, we need a framework that brings this together. In other words, who assesses the degree with which our portfolios are aligned uh, with the trans uh, transition. And we put out a concept note uh, that addresses that. 
And finally, and crucially, we need an approach that uh, promotes the managed phase out of high emission assets, assets that will be stranded, um, uh, but are part of and must be part uh, through a managed phase out, responsible phase out of a just transition. Taken together, these building blocks will help get capital to companies with credible plans to reduce their emissions in line with the Paris Accord, and it will support that orderly phase out of stranded assets. Critically, the degree and pace of those transitions will vary by region and by the level of development of countries. And in these regards, the variety and diversity of Asia is particularly marked. That's why we need Asian engagement and support. I said I wanted to flag two areas. The second is as important as this framework, if not more. Look, there are enormous financial resources in GFADs, but we need a radical new approach, and I use that term advisedly, a radical new approach to mobilizing private capital and investment in emerging and developing economies. Specifically, GFANS has called for new country platforms that deploy blended finance at scale and with high multipliers, something our host, our co-host, the Asian Development Bank, is very familiar with. We need this form of blended finance. We need to connect private finance with ambitious country NDCs or climate strategies. We need to channel technical assistance and manage, manage the wind down of stranded assets such as coal generation. In all these regards, we welcome the launch of new Just Energy Transition Partnerships, or JETPs, and we also welcome other country-tailored efforts that finance the global transition. We're dedicating, as part of GFAN, significant resources to support private sector mobilization uh, directly into these JETPs, and also through the Climate Finance Leadership Initiative, or CFLI, and Fast Infrastructure. Our highest priority is to translate those high-level ambitions into tangible action and real net-zero-aligned transactions. Now, it's essential that net-zero finance generally, and GFAN specifically, accounts for regional differences. GFAN's focus on mobilization is complemented by our wider work to engage financial institutions and policymakers across every region. And that's why earlier this month, we launched our first regional network, GFAN's Asia Pacific Network, and we established a physical presence in the region. You'll hear at this forum from our dedicated director, Yuki Yasui. Yuki will coordinate our offices across the Asia Pacific region, and she'll help ensure that GFAN's incorporates your feedback into our outputs. GFAN's work in Asia Pacific will be informed also by our regional senior advisory board, chaired by Ravi Mena, the head of the Monetary Authority of Singapore and the chair of the Network for Greening the Financial System. I'm delighted that Wu Chang Um, the managing director general of the ADB, will join Ravi, as well as Hiro Mizuno and President Jin of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and the CEOs of the Singapore Exchange and KB Financial Group. Mr. Um's depth of experience and tireless commitment to climate are invaluable, and we're excited uh, that he's going to work closely with the advisory board as it provides strategic direction, regional insights, and expert guidance to the network and to GFANS. We'll continue to work with Asian banks and asset managers and insurers who are in GFANS to lead by example in target setting, in reporting, and implementing their commitments to net zero. But we're also going to provide a platform to engage with our work on transition planning and net zero finance for those financial institutions who are in Asian countries that have not yet committed to uh, net zero by 2050. This will support knowledge sharing and open dialogue to ensure a truly global, sustainable transition. At its heart, achieving net zero is about ensuring that climate change is at the core of every financial decision. That way, capital will flow to companies and countries that get emissions down. To be clear, the transition does not mean flipping a green switch, but it's about going to where the emissions are and helping to reduce them. 
In this way, finance can be a catalyst that accelerates what governments and companies initiate. So we look forward with, uh, to engaging the financial system, to, with working with policymakers and regulators as Asian financial institutions uh, work to do just that. And I extend the welcome to uh, of my co-chair, Mike Bloomberg, and Vice Chair Mary Shapiro, and all members of GFANS, to all organizations and partners who are connected, uh, who wish to connect to our work. And I thank those who are already helping us to develop this system that's essential for sustainable uh, future and inclusive and prosperous growth in Asia and therefore the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark Carney, for your interesting speech. And one key message I take away from Mr. Carney's deliberations is that to address climate change, the world needs a sustainable revolution at the scale of the industrial revolution at the, and at the pace of the digital transformation. And the second uh, message I heard that the Asia Pacific region will determine whether or not the world succeeds in the quest to net zero. And finally, I learned we have to understand the importance of the role of financial institutions and that all stakeholders have to work together to, to develop a system that is supportive for a sustainable future and inclusive growth in Asia and the Pacific. And I hear the invitation or the call for collaboration by key funds to bring together the financial sector to accelerate the transition to a net zero economy. So this was our first keynote. Tomorrow we have a second one for you, but we are coming to the end of our opening session and we are going to continue in a few minutes from now with our first expert dialogue on green and blue finance, moderated by one of the most known media professionals in the Asia region, Ms. Sharon Jitlail. And today, just as a reminder, we have also a second session on crowding in private finance for blue and green innovation, moderated by Ms. Mitzi Borromeo, starting at 4 p.m. Manila time. Not to forget that we have program ahead of us on Tuesday and Wednesday. So please check out our website for all up-to-date information. And we also invite you again to share your thoughts and comments with our hashtag Asia Finance Forum 2022. So that's it for the opening session. We have a short break of approximately seven minutes. And then I see you all again for our first session of the Asia Finance Forum. Thank you very much for joining in so far and see you in a few minutes.